Amen. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you, the Cabin Challenge faithful that are here this morning on this Labor Day weekend. My name is Bruce. I'm the pastor here. Uh, if you're part of the uh, diaspora, those believers who are scattered far and wide to cabins and lakes, wherever they may be, you are also welcome as you stream along with us. This morning, we continue in the book of Galatians. Uh, so if you have a Bible, we'll be in chapter 4. Uh, and most of the passages that you see, that you hear me read, will also be on the screen. Uh, two weeks ago, I want to kind of fill in the, the gap here a little bit, because we weren't in Galatians last week, but two weeks ago, we ended with this. A good influencer slash mentor slash discipler sees as their ultimate goal for Christ. They, their ultimate goal is for Christ to be formed in you. And we talked about the morph word, the morpho, uh, that appears only once in the New Testament, appears in that passage, to be morphed into Christ, to be changed from even, uh, as, the, as the Apostle Paul writes, this tiny little embryo of a disciple, as a believer, just beginning, just starting out, uh, to go from that stage in your faith to fully developed, looking like Jesus kind of a follower. That's the goal. And I hope that's the goal of all of us here this morning, that as we spend time around each other in, through fellowship and as we gather for worship services, you go to Bible studies, all of these things that we do, the greater goal as we rub off on each other uh, is somewhere in the back of our minds at least, I hope that my presence in your life helps to move you towards becoming more like Christ. That's what we looked at. That's what Paul's doing as he's, as he's uh, writing his Galatians, as he's stressing uh, all this theology that we've looked at from chapter 2 all the way through now the end of chapter 4. So to, to help put this in context and perspective, what we're looking at this morning. I think we need to step back and get the bigger picture one more time of what's going on in Galatians. Paul has kind of a similar or familiar way of approaching his letters. Uh, and if you've read any of the epistles of Paul, then you probably see that there's certain pattern. Uh, there is a certain pattern that he uh, uses in these different letters. Ran across in my deep study uh, and embellishing my deep study with social media. I ran across this meme uh, yesterday, General Pauline letter outline. That's basically what you get with Paul. At the beginning of almost every letter, grace. He extends grace, grace and peace to you. Familiar wording with Apostle Paul. I thank God for you. Hold fast to the gospel and nothing else. And for the love of everything holy, stop being stupid. And some way he says that in there. And then, oh yeah, Timothy says hi. So that is kind of a standard approach to what Paul is writing about. And, and this outline works even better for Galatians. Because we've just looked at the last two, three chapters of a whole lot of that one, two, three, that fourth bullet point there. There's a whole lot of that in the book of Galatians. A lot of that is in 1 Corinthians uh, as well, but... But boy, Galatians, he's addressing it, and he keeps bringing out these things. And he sounds harsh, but he's saying things in a harsh way to get, a point, uh, to get across the major point. So that's, that works at one level. I want to offer an even more general way that Paul addresses people, whether it's in Galatians or his other epistles. Uh, pretty much everything he writes breaks down to these two things. Number one. Remember, bring to mind, not just know certain things, not just even memorize certain things that I'm telling you, uh, remember with heart and mind, deeply, so it's changing you, remember who Christ is and what he's done for you. And it's so good that we start there this morning because we forget. Ancient people forget, and that is pretty, you know, cross-cultural, it spans all generations and, and eras and centuries, right? We tend to forget. We tend to forget to apply what it is that we've learned. And so because of that, we've got to remind ourselves constantly, even daily, who Christ is, 
what the gospel, the good news is about, how I need to refocus myself, put my eyes back on him, remember, 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 so that, number two, I will continue to follow Christ and nothing else and no one else. So when, or so that when, when different ideas that confuse uh, different add-ons to the gospel appear, uh, th- other ideas that compete with the purity and the simplicity of the gospel, when they come into my mind, uh, maybe they come into the church, uh, wherever they come from, whatever they are, I, because I remember, I will more clearly understand the differences, reject those so that I follow Christ and nothing else. So, we see that a lot. We've seen that in Galatians as well. Uh, let me give you a quick reminder of what it is that we've seen. If you have a Bible out, I'd encourage you to turn to Galatians chapter 2 because uh, this helps to form now our immediate context of what's going on in the heart of Paul's book. What is, what is it that we need to remember? If you go back to Galatians chapter 2, I'll read just a couple of verses, verses 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And if you remember, if you don't, I'll tell you again, uh, Gentile sinners, you can put the little quotes around that, okay? Uh, That's maybe how you see Gentiles, those of you from the Jewish faith. But no no matter where you're from, okay, no matter what your background is, yet we know, verse 16, that a person, any person, is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And that, in that uh, uh, passage there in chapter 2, it launches Paul into all this deep and rich theology and all those examples that Paul brings our minds to, and he'll do it one more time here this morning that we'll look at in chapter 4, but that frames our thinking so that we will continue to follow him. And how is it that we follow? And this is where the rubber meets the road. In chapters 5 and chapter 6, we understand what the therefore is there for. So before we dive deep into those last two chapters, which we've got to, We've got to understand why we do those things, how we do them, what fills us, what motivates us, what gives us understanding, all of those things that are so critical. You've got to make sure we're coming from the right place, that is the gospel, before we know how and why we do the rest of it. So we'll get that uh, the rest of this month and into October before Advent and Christmas and all these things come that are just around the corner. But before we do that, we've got to spend just a few more moments here in chapter 4. So let's read. This is, I'll just give you a heads up, uh, chapter 4, verses 21 and forward. Some of the most difficult uh, verses to interpret in all the New Testament uh, because everybody that I've read has different ideas and uh, where are we going with this, especially when we talk about allegory. So we're going to read them. And then we're going to talk about them and see how essential they are and why is it that Paul ends with those in this part of the book before we launch into the therefore. Okay, here we go. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now, you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he he who was born according to the flesh 
persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Okay? Wow. That's a thick one, right? That's a challenging one. So many different ideas that are introduced there. Where in the world is he coming from, and why would that be significant to us? So we're going to break it down, everything that we can you know, get a hold of in just a few minutes here uh, before we launch into what the rest of what Paul has for us. So back to verse 21. Crucial that we understand the big question as he begins the passage. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? In other words, do you still not get it? <laughs> now, after all of this time, he spent arguing, presenting the argument, trying to clarify for everyone uh, all of those angry words even that he's used. Do you still not get it at this point? Okay, that's the introduction that we have to this passage. What is it that the law is actually saying to you? What is really going on there? Why would you still choose that after all that I've explained to you? Why do you still go back to something that's finished, that it's completed, that it's ended? And even worse than that, if you try to go to the law to find life and salvation, you're just going to find death. Why don't you still get it? That's what he's beginning with for us this morning. And then he launches into this allegory to try to make clear what the law is saying so they will hopefully finally hear it and understand what it is saying. So what's an allegory? Okay, so a quick definition here. Allegory is a story interpreted in a way that reveals some hidden meaning. Early church, uh, church fathers, St. Augustine is a perfect example, most early church fathers, their way of interpreting, their default set of interpretation was to go allegorical. Now, there can be all sorts of problems with that. We're going to look at it in a second, but that's the way most of them interpret it because that's, well, that's what Paul did, okay? St. Augustine in the fourth century. Have you heard of St. Augustine? He wrote the, the famous book, Confessions, uh, that has been read. It's a literary classic, not just by believers, but uh, worldwide for centuries. So St. Augustine, way back uh, in the third and fourth centuries, all the teaching and preaching he did, uh, excellent stuff for the church, to preserve the church uh, at that time and during that era. He used allegories, and one of, the, one of his famous allegories is uh, the way that he interpreted the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're not going to read that, but that's back in Luke chapter 10. St. Augustine preached and taught uh, allegorically with the Good Samaritan. So what does that mean? So he looked at the character of the Samaritan and said uh, that Samaritan guy in the story represents Christ. The robbers in, the, in this parable, they represent the devils or the devil and demons. The inn that the uh, Good Samaritan takes the guy beat up it, the inn represents the church, and the innkeeper represents the Apostle Paul. Interesting stuff, right? Uh, you could kind of look back at the parable and go, okay, well, I kind of see that. Maybe that works. Well, here's the problem with allegories. They're not always in every way bad. Paul uses it here in, in the book of Galatians, so that's not a bad thing. But sometimes people go too far with allegories. They interject ideas that are more, well, I think it's like this, and, and that I'll just go with that, okay? There's some meaning in here somewhere. And you really hear, you hear people do this all the time. Sometimes it's even in Bible studies where you might hear somebody say, or maybe you said it, maybe I've said it. Well, I, here's what I think it means. You read the passage, and then you just kind of quickly go from what you've read in, in Scripture to, well, I'm going to go off on this tangent and say, it means this. Because I kind of see this idea coming out of the Bible passage. Well, maybe, or maybe what you see is just kind of your own preference, right? Influenced by what you had for dinner more than good biblical interpretation. So that also happened. 
So here is where we've got to start, and here's where we've got to return when it comes to a good interpretation. First rule of interpretation is this. It can't mean something now that it didn't already mean then. Make sense? You, can't, you just don't have the freedom today, and Augusta didn't have the freedom then, really, to insert an idea that wasn't already a part of the author's intention in the first place. You get into really dangerous areas when you do that. And a lot of really popular cults have formed around that idea, that notion that I could just say, well, I think it means this. Well, no, you skipped all sorts of stuff. So how do we know St. Augustine got off on the wrong track? Well, when he said that the end represents a church, nobody knew what the church was yet. That was a whole new concept, a whole new thing that Jesus was teaching on and developing. And even if they did understand the church, they had no idea who the Apostle Paul was because he wasn't around yet, okay? So it couldn't have meant that because Paul wasn't around. Everybody, that makes sense, right? Okay, so um, I'm going to get away from the whole English kind of thing for uh, the rest of the sermon, but I just want to make that clear that Paul can use allegory because he brings us back to a place in the original testament where he is working hard to clarify what's going on and he doesn't interject a different idea that wasn't already there okay so can we use allegory today only if you do good interpretation and good bible study first then possibly the problem with it is most people don't tend to take the time to study scripture in the first place to make sure they don't get off on the wrong track later. That's the danger of allegory. So, just wanted to say that. I think that's important for us this morning. So what is Paul saying? Have you noticed, if you've been with us the whole time and going through the the deeper theology stuff and the central part of this book, Paul keeps directing us back, not just to the law, to try to argue with people who are all about the law and the rules and the works, he goes back before the law. He goes, he takes us all the way back to Abraham and Sarah and their condition and the promise that was given by God in the covenant to Abraham before Moses was ever thought of, hundreds of years before Moses was ever born. That's what Paul does for those Galatians and for all of us. It is so critical that we be thinking in the bigger terms of God's promise for his people that is bigger than the law. And that's a huge thought for these Jewish individuals who are all about law. There's something greater. There's something bigger that we cannot forget. So here's what he does. He he gives us this allegory. So let me uh, try to unpack this a little bit. He basically says, uh, you're still stuck in this and you still don't get it. You know, what's going on with that? So I'm gonna give you another story, an allegory, kind of an illustration. He's saying there's two covenants, really, that there are at work. One of them really is all about a covenant of slavery. You're still in bondage. The perfect example is going all the way back to Abraham, and and Abraham and Sarah, one of their servants, her name was Hagar. Abraham and Sarah had received the promise from God that they're going to have children, and that that's going to be the extension of the covenant and the promise through them. Well, the promise isn't coming. They haven't had kids. They're super old. Most of you here gathered, I think, remember the story. We just went through Genesis recently. Uh, They get impatient. Well, Sarah's got this servant, Hagar. She gives her servant to Abraham. They sleep together. They have a child. His name is Ishmael. And it's tempting to think that, well, when you get impatient with God, you can take matters into your own hands. Well, that's not the promise. And in fact, that, their action only led, it began with slavery, and it only led to more slavery. The promise wasn't fulfilled in their impatient reaction, uh, not willing to wait on God and to respond to him. So, you may think that there's an answer there, but you're still a slave. And we looked at being under the guardian a few weeks ago, if you remember that. Uh, Paul uses that idea, that term. You're still under uh, someone else who is controlling you and telling you which way to go and what to do, and that's the law. And you're just, you just don't get it yet. 
<laughs> you're under that yoke of slavery. So that's one covenant. So what's the other covenant? That is the covenant of freedom. The promise that was given to Abraham and Sarah is eventually fulfilled, not dependent on the level of Abraham and Sarah's faithfulness, which is a good thing, right? Because their faithfulness and their obedience was lacking, yet God is still true to his covenant and to his promise, God is faithful even when his people are not filled with faithful, faithlessness. So the promise goes through Abraham and Sarah to Isaac. And Paul wants us to look all the way back to them and see that there is freedom in the faithful response to what God has already done and promised to do then you can begin to see yourself as part of that promised lineage. I can now choose to be, in my response to Christ, part of that covenant, the beautiful covenant promise of freedom. Now we have to pause because that's the perfect setup for chapter 5. We live no longer slaves to anything not even the law. Now, that's saying a lot in just a little bit, and we'll begin to unpack that in the next few weeks. No longer a slave to anything, even the law. In Christ, we are truly free. Maybe, perhaps, one of the biggest problems today with the church, with believers, is our lack of understanding of what it means to be free, to live free, no longer shackled by anything or anyone, set free to live by faith in what Christ has promised, even though we cannot see clearly what lies ahead. We don't, none of us knows, right, what's right around the corner. Christ is sufficient to live in freedom, freedom from fear, from anxiety, from the past, even freedom from the unknown of the future, to be truly, in an amazing way, set free. If Christ can make you that Free, why would you ever return to being a slave? If you've been set free, it is pure craziness to go back and say, put the shackles back on. I have this freedom is annoying. Being able to live <laughs> free from uh, the, the restraints and guardians of being told what to do, the, the, uh, the certain promise of death the certain destruction of my life even, everything coming down and falling apart. Are you kidding me? To be set free means truly, wonderfully, amazingly, eternally free. That's where Paul takes us, but yet he has to find one more way to emphasize to us the covenant of the promise of freedom is so much better and more wonderful than what it is that you are settling for Galatians. Now, there is this one quote here that I want to focus back on that we just read. Okay, I, I, Maybe I'm just introducing more questions than answers. It's a, it's a complicated passage, but one more thing I want to highlight here. Chapter 4, verse 27, Paul quotes from the prophet Isaiah. And maybe it's one more, what? What are you talking about? Because it does sound like that. So let me read it again. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. What in the world? Paul reaches back to the prophet. Uh, it's just an amazing thing. When he does this, when he quotes 
uh, original testament and when he brings in prophets even you know even if we don't understand it at first it's worth it to take some time like why in the world does he pull out that one tiny little verse that little passage from isaiah and drops it right in smack in the middle of what it is that he is developing here so just if we can simplify it we'll say it like this you galatians you believers today you can and you should rejoice. What does he say? For his first word, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Nobody, Sarah didn't, no one who wants to have a child rejoices in their barrenness. And especially in the midst of a promise by God that you will have children, you will have children like the sand on the seashore, right? And yet you're still barren. You, your initial response is not rejoicing in where you're at. The response is, why? Why, God, aren't you coming through on your promise? Why aren't you delivering me out of these circumstances that I'm in? Why isn't it better right now? Yet, you have reason to rejoice. Because, why? Because God made the promise And his promises transcend the difficulties and the issues of this earth. You can break forth and cry aloud, even if you're not in labor yet, for the children of the desolate one will be more, even more than Ishmael and his line and everything that's going off and that other covenant, that other covenant of death. You can rejoice knowing that God is certain and he's true and he will deliver on his promises. No other way can work. Do not compromise. Even in the moment where you're struggling the most, where is God in this? Don't dare compromise. Don't give in to thinking that God isn't good on his promises. There is reason now, not just when the baby finally comes. There is reason now to rejoice and to sing and have a party because God is good on his promises. There is no, excuse me, there is only one way to receive the ultimate promise through God. And now we see that in Christ. So wrap it up. Do you get it? That's Galatians, that's Paul, that's a weird allegory thing, whatever, but if we can focus in and make it personal, do you get it? I've known a lot of people over from, uh, almost 30 years, Is it th- almost, it's 30 years, <laughs> a lot of different churches, they were very religious and knew a lot of Bible and shook their heads at the right time. And a lot of those people didn't get it. They were giving into this covenant of death. They thought they understood the gospel, but really it was a gospel plus, which according to Paul makes it no gospel. Do you understand what it is that this book, the message that this book has for you today? So I go back as a reminder to chapter 2, verse 20, my favorite verse, my life verse in the Bible. I have it there on the screen. For I've been crucified with Christ. That's what Paul says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If being right with God was something that I could attain in any other way other than Christ, then I nullify all of it. It's all worthless. It's all done. Nothing. It's Christ or it's nothing. So let me focus in on the center part of that verse. The life that I live, that I live. Now, I live in the, that I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. Is that something that you've become so clear on in your walk with Christ that you can say what Paul says and you own it? You know it. 
Yeah, there are doubts. Yeah, there's confusion. Yeah, there's frustration. Yeah, there are times that are just plain hard, right? We all, we've all been there, or maybe you're there right now. But what transcends all of that stuff of life is I got my faith in Christ, and I know that I know he's good, and I know that's the way, and it isn't another way. My hope is in him. I trust him, and I choose to keep returning to him every moment I think of him, every day when I have those struggles, every day, no matter if the sun's shining or not. I choose to come back to him. I trust that he has everything that I need, and it's not anywhere else. I rejoice, even though I feel and am barren, that he's still enough, and he's still good on his promises. Is the heart of that verse your heart? Do you get it? Now, if you don't get it, I think the message of Galatians is still, is still valid and it's still true. All of our struggling, all of your striving, there is, there's a dead end to all of it. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you haven't experienced it yet. You will hit a dead end. We all do it. The things that we think make life work fail us. There is a point where Paul is saying to be right with God You've got to realize it's only in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. So the passage that we read this morning, the beginning of uh, our service was uh, from uh, Jeremiah. The prophet speaks on behalf of God, speaking of a new covenant. There is something new that's coming to you that it will be written on your heart, that will change your mind, that everybody will know me. You don't need a teacher anymore to say, this is the law, do this, do that. The guardianship is over. Jeremiah says, you will all know me, and my mercies will be enough for you. It's that simple. When you really finally begin to realize who Jesus is and how much he loves you and what he's done for you, every day becomes a new experience, and how, how, how can that be for me? How can you love me that much? How can you have that much mercy? We sang this morning, our sins, they are many. And what else do we sing? How can that be? Take just a moment to pile up your recent sins in your mind. His mercy is more? Are you kidding me? God would choose to do that for me? I can't out him. I can't wreck his mercy. I'm not saying you should try, but it's true. No matter what you do today or tomorrow, his mercies are new every day. Christ is that loving, is that forgiving. When you begin to realize that, and when that sinks in, it changes you. I hope it's changing you. I hope you begin to then see any other way of trying to make life work fails utterly, miserably when you have the view of God's grace and mercy in your mind and in your eyes. That's what Jeremiah spoke of. That's what we have now. And that's what we realize in Christ. Luke chapter 22, verse 20 speaks of, and that passage has the story of Jesus and the Last Supper, okay? Uh, I'm not going to read the whole passage. We're going to read Paul's rendition of it, 1 Corinthians 11, as we come to the table this morning. Just remember this. Everything for centuries that was spoken of, beginning with, with Abraham and the promise given all in you, all the nations will be blessed. What Jeremiah, what all the prophets spoke of, what Paul keeps directing us back to, all this talk of a new covenant, of freedom and hope and forgiveness, having a, a fresh relationship with God always. It doesn't get wrecked no matter what I do. All of this comes back to, as Luke tells us, Jesus taking the cup at the supper, and he says, this is the new covenant. It's my blood, and I give it. I let it pour out on the ground for you. Take it 
and drink it. And every time you do that, remember me. Now, we're pretty sure the disciples didn't understand clearly what was going on in that moment when Jesus first uttered those words. But now we can look back. Can you imagine? I mean, just take it in perspective. Centuries of searching and longing for all that the prophets spoke of and all that the law pointed to. And in that dark room, that small group of guys leaning over in their elbows and Jesus taking the cup, I meant. I meant. Everybody always lived and died longing for this day, and I'm it. And you get to taste of this new covenant for the first time. And then we're brought into that, that moment, which is this moment, this morning. We remember Jesus saying, every time you do this, remember me. I'm the new covenant that covers you completely in my mercy and grace. That covenant is the only way to come to God, to know him, to have life that never ends. That's what we rejoice in. Yeah, there's barren moments. But what God gives through Christ fills us and completes us and carries us forward. There is never any doubt in that because Jesus has always been good on his promise and we can be certain that his faithfulness will continue through the rest of our lives and on into eternity. What we do this morning puts our eyes back on the covenant, the real true covenant, and reminds us of the goodness of Jesus on the cross for us. So as we prepare for that, I want to read like we do uh, every time first, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you're watching, streaming, somewhere, wherever you are, uh, I would encourage you to share with us during this time, take something to eat, something to, to drink as we share this time together and as we close with our worship songs this morning. This is what Paul does to remind us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning of verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For, I, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, we pause to thank you for your living and active word, for the reminders that it gives us and how it redirects us back to your covenant. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds so that we would get it. And if we've forgotten it, that you would bring us back. Bring us back to your mercy and grace. Bring us back to your good news that never disappoints. Realign us, Lord, where we've, uh, in places where we've tried to add to your gospel, where we've confused ourselves, where we've become frustrated. Lord, uh, clear our vision to see you to understand your new covenant of hope and grace and forgiveness and restore, Lord, in us that desire and that longing for more of you to live in freedom. Oh, Jesus, we want more of that. So as we partake this morning, I pray that you would bless it and make this a time that inwardly and outwardly we rejoice in what it is that you've done for us. We do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen.